My name is Jim Strickland, and uh, today I am interviewing Frederick Trapnell. This is uh, March 27th, 2014, and uh, you prefer to be called Fritz. Yes, I prefer so Fritz. So I will we'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, Fritz, let me start off, if I may, to ask by asking a little bit about uh, where you were born, where you grew up, and all that kind of thing. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I was born in Washington, D.C. My father was a naval officer, and uh, my mother was a Californian. She was from San Diego and had moved back there when he, his duty transferred. So I was born in Washington, but I actually grew up in, in San Diego, in Coronado, uh, yeah, mostly, uh, though I went to high school back east. Uh, and uh, then I, uh, uh, after high school, immediately after high school, 1950, I uh, ended up in the Marine Corps. Uh, and. Uh, uh, during the Korean War, as the Korean War broke out, and uh, they were good enough to send me to electronics, aviation electronics school. So that's where I first got into electronics, uh, and uh, I spent two years in the, on active duty, and then uh, then went to college at uh, at Caltech in Pasadena. Uh, okay. Did my undergraduate uh, in physics. Uh, was in it in physics long enough to discover that I was not going to make a physicist. And uh, so I stayed on for another year and got a master's degree in electrical engineering. So okay. that's how I got started. Excellent. And uh, I'd like to talk to you more about your dad, but maybe we can do that later. Okay. Um, but was he a, an influence on your life at this point? He and my mother were divorced when I was three. Uh, and. Uh, my mother remarried a marine officer, incidentally, uh, <laughs> uh, who was a big figure in my life. Uh, and I didn't really get to know my own father until high school time, uh, when he was on the East Coast and uh, he, uh, for my sins, insisted that I go to school back East, which I did. And then I got began to get to know him on vacations and, and uh, uh, well, go down there, uh, you know, when school broke. I was in a boarding school. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the, uh, so I got to know him then and got to know him better and better. He was, a, he was difficult on his children. <laughs> and, and it wasn't until a lot later that I got to know him very well and we got to be very close. So he was a big influence later in my life, but not in the early days. Okay. But your stepfather, the uh, Marine, uh, yes. uh, may have been a big influence. Yes, he was a big influence. What, uh, how did he influence you? Uh, well, he was quite different from my father. He was a a uh, very uh, <coughs> physical uh, kind of a person. Uh, learned a lot about uh, fishing and hunting and, and, and skin diving and, and, uh, uh, and, and he was also a, a strong, a lot of integrity, a lot about uh, honesty and, and, and integrity. My father was the same way, but he, my stepfather had the most influence when I was young about it. So yes, he was a big, influence on, on, on my growing up time. Terrific. But you ended up at school at Caltech in Caltech, Pasadena, Pasadena and got right. a master's in electrical engineering. I did. Okay. And I think you said you uh, had your first exposure to a computer there. Yes, I did. Yeah, the first exposure I had there was uh, uh, in, I, I took a course in logical design as a senior, uh, which fascinated me. And I thought, wow, this is really an interesting application for electronics. Up to that point, I had decided I was going to be involved in electronics because uh, that's what I, the Marine Corps had started me off in, but uh, this was the most interesting application of electronics that I could see, and uh, it, of course, was very new. Uh, and uh, the, so when I went to graduate school, I got a research assistantship to maintain their first uh, digital computer, which was an Electrodata 205. They'd had an earlier IBM calculator that I can't remember the number of. Might it have been an IBM 610? It All might have point. been. It might have been. It, it stood about six foot ten inches high, <laughs> as I recall. Yep. <laughs> uh, that would have been it. Then. And okay. uh, paper tape. Uh, well, so was the Electrodata paper tape. Uh, so that was my introduction to computers. Uh, IBM also got the the first Libroscope LGP-30, which mm -hmm. uh, was designed by a graduate student at Caltech and was, who trans and Caltech, I think, sold the design to Libroscope and in return got the first machine, which is 
never a great thing to do. First machines are <laughs> usually uh, have problems, and that one did, though it, it worked pretty well. And so I did my first programming uh, on those two machines, the Libroscope LGP30 and the, and the uh, Electrodata 205. Okay, so that was both programming and the actual hardware maintenance? Yeah, I had to do the actual hardware maintenance on the LGP, on the Electrodata machine, but uh, I did, I programmed both of them. Uh, yes, I had to, uh, I don't know if we want to talk about the programming, but it's, it might be of interest. Well, they were both, the uh, Electrodata was a drum machine. Drum right? machine, drum machine, very and comparable. the Libroscope was a drum machine also. And the Libroscope was a drum machine as well. Uh, they were, the uh, LGP30, I'm sorry, the Electrodata 205 was very comparable to the IBM 650. They were uh, at the same time uh, and similar technologies. Uh, the uh, Libroscope was a small machine, supposed to be a desktop, the nearest thing to a desktop. Uh, it, uh, as I recall, it had 4,016, maybe 12-bit words, and I had to, my a professor asked me to write a decimal floating point package for it, which I did. Uh, and it took me perhaps four to six weeks, and he kept needling me about what was taking so long. Uh, and when I got through with it uh, and uh, began to test it, I had to tell him that, uh, you know, of the 4,096 words that were available, I had used 4,025 of them <laughs> to write this package. And he was hit the ceiling. <laughs> this was ridiculous. So he took my code and went away for about two weeks and he came back and he said, I found an error and I fixed it and it now takes 4,030 <laughs> words. <laughs> so uh, it, that was a real challenge, interesting But, but challenge. not exactly a subroutine, right? Not exactly a subroutine. This package filled the whole machine. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd key in a, you know, a decimal set of decimal numbers and the uh, operation you wanted to perform on it, and, uh, and it would do the calculation and give you the answers. You, you know that we have a Libroscope, right? You, do you? You've seen that? I haven't seen oh, that we'll one. Make sure I should take that. a look at that. Yeah, oh, okay. that was an old, <laughs> yes, that goes back uh, some number of years. So that was my first introduction to computers, yes. Okay, so you were in software before you ever got out of, in effect, out of grad school. Yes. And then you uh, went to work for IBM? How did yes, that I happen? Yes, I did. Well, the IBM recruiters came out to Caltech, uh, and uh, I had decided I, I wanted to go to work in, if you will, civilian electronics and not in military electronics. I'd been very closely associated with the military, but I was interested to see if there was really going to be an application for electronics in civilian business. So I interviewed with uh, AT&T Bell Labs and IBM and got job offers from both and, and uh, uh, IBM and Poughkeepsie and, and elected to go to Poughkeepsie. And, uh, but that was a result of being uh, recruiting in, in college. Okay, and of course, IBM had a sort of a the old systems stuff was at Endicott, and the new computer stuff was mostly being done at Poughkeepsie. I think Is that right? That's probably true. Most of the computers, I've forgotten where the 650 was done, but it, because uh, it was before my time, yeah. so I'm not sure where it was done, but it was likely Poughkeepsie, but Poughkeepsie certainly had all of the so-called big machines, the 701, 702, 704, right. 705, the, and then got followed on, of course, to the, the transistor machines, the 7090, et cetera. Yes. Okay, so when you're at Poughkeepsie, what, what did they have you do first? Well, I elected, I was all, I allowed to go several places. Uh, Stretch was in, the, in being built at the time, and that was an interesting proposition, but the Special Engineering Products Division appealed to me because it uh, was involved in a lot of different kinds of products. Uh, and things that, that uh, uh, looked like it would offer a lot of different challenges. So I elected to join that division, a very small division that didn't last very long, uh, about three years, and then it merged into the Advanced Systems Development Division, ASDD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, that's where I started, and I did a number of things that, uh, uh, one of them was some work on a, uh, uh, on that B70 program, they sent me up to, not Kingston, but uh, 
Burlington, near Endicott. Wait a minute, it's not Burlington, is it? It's Binghamton. They had a lab, a military lab in Binghamton, as I recall, okay. that was an adjunct to the one in Kingston. And I went up there to work on some, some of the bomb nav system on the B-70, mm -hmm. uh, briefly. Then uh, I worked on uh, how to digitize waveforms on a cathode ray tube, so that to digitize those so that you can analyze them uh, offline. And uh, designed and, and a machine for that, got a patent for that. Uh, then I <coughs> don't remember exactly how it happened, but I got very much interested in com computer communications. How does a computer talk to a telephone line? IBM had already built the uh, transceiver, which was a card-to-card -card right. system over right. a telephone line. And that work was done in Poughkeepsie. I, uh, we were interested in how to get a computer to do that. The Sabre system was already being designed, uh, and they used special controllers on their 7090 to do that. Uh, the Sage system was in operation, and it had that same capability of talking to telephone lines. But it wasn't very general purpose. These were very specialized to those machines and operate in certain specialized ways. And the question was, how do you get any old computer to talk to uh, telephone lines. And more particularly, how do you get a computer to talk to a hundred telephone lines? That seemed like a big number in those days. <coughs> uh, so I started to work on that problem uh, and got, uh, first of all, we were, we were concerned with what to use for modems, modulation and demodulating these signals onto telephone lines. The phone company was very possessive about who got on their telephone lines and with what kinds of signals. So we were. This AT and T was still in the a monopoly state. AT and T was still in the monopoly state. <laughs> yes, uh, they weren't nasty to us, but they were firm, <laughs> uh, and we talked to them a lot about uh, about their modems, about the performance of their modems. And in those days, uh, you know, 600 bits per second was a pretty fast. You know, was the fastest thing they had. The card transceiver operated at something like 200, equivalent to 200 bits per second. Mm. Uh, and uh, that signaling system just wasn't going to work, the four out of eight coding system they used. AT&T had a frequency shift uh, modem, which uh, operated at 600. And they were talking about going to 1,200, that that was going to be a big leap forward. Uh, the guys in IBM in San Jose, Emil Hopner, Harold Markey, uh, about that time, invented a new way of signaling on a telephone line, uh, phase shift signaling, which by the way is standard today. Uh, but they invented that technology in San Jose mm -hmm. and it offered potentially much higher speeds than the phone company was gonna offer. So I remember spending time out here in San Jose with them uh, and uh, trying to convince the phone company that maybe they ought to look at the modem that we had. And that, I've forgotten how that ended up, but for me, it morphed into an assignment that, that I wanted very much was to let's figure out how to build a general purpose controller uh, to allow systems like the newly arrived 7770, uh, no, I'm sorry, 70. 7070, 7070. The, the, the 7070 was a new machine at the right. time. Right. It was coming along with, the 7090 was already there, I think the 7070 followed it, and then the 7050, and how do you get those machines uh, to talk to a lot of telephone lines? So I worked on the design of that and built several prototype, uh, at least one prototype of it. Uh, uh, and in the end, out of that came uh, the first uh, uh, IBM front end, pr first pr front end processor in the world that I know of was the IBM 7750. Uh, it was a stored program controller that sat on a tape channel and the computer could talk to it like a tape. These computers did not have interrupt systems, so you couldn't from the outside go in and say, hey, I've got something here, which all the later computers, of course, did. Uh, so the the internal programming had to be, had to uh, recognize that periodically it was going to have to pull this mm -hmm. unit sitting out board. Mm -hmm. But the unit out board did all of the acquiring of data, transmitting of data, 
and transmitted between the computer and the 7750, transmitted buffers of, uh, I've forgotten what size, I think you could, variable. Uh, anyway, it was the first uh, communications controller of its type in IBM and possibly the first run-in processor product. Uh, maybe other people built. Uh, and it supported a lot of different device types yes. and different communication yes. protocols. Yes, it did. It supported uh, everything from 11-bit uh, signals, which the uh, supported. 1001, I'll bet. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It supported various speeds, uh, selectable, uh, and you could have different lines working at different speeds. Uh, it did all of its. Uh, <coughs> analysis of receiving signals was all done digitally. It was, uh, you come right off the modem straight into the, to the 7750 and it digitally uh, looked at the incoming signals, sampled uh, the input, uh, and we had worked out with the guys in San Jose, with Marky and, and uh, Hopner uh, and John McLaughlin, who was one of the smartest guys I ever met out here. They had done some work that demonstrated that if you'd uh, I think from information theory, you can prove you need to sample at least twice per bit, but if you've got a lot of noise in there, you need to be m do it much more frequently. So we adopted a standard that says bits have to be sampled at least seven times per, per bit. And you could adjust the, the uh, various lines to the frequencies that were coming in uh, by program. Uh, and, uh, but it it and was a controller the in the sense that your job was to gather data from the telephone lines and pass it to a mainframe. And the other way. But it w and the other way. And the other way, yes. Uh, but it was programmable, so it in was that sense, a stored program. it's a computer. It absolutely was a stored program computer. Uh, I remember Fred Brooks uh, once uh, was, well, was part of a group that was called to, to, to audit. We did audits in those days, mm -hmm. <laughs> do an engineering audit of this thing. And he, he was very, as I recall, he said, I stayed up all night reading this manual, which I'd written, and said, this is a really interesting machine <laughs> because it is so different from anything we've done before. And uh, so uh, uh, it was a stored program computer, uh, a front end computer, uh, you know, yeah. uh, in, in the classic sense uh, that it was a little computer sat on board. Other people, of course, built front end computers later. CDC was famous for front end computers. <laughs> and so this must be what, about 1959 or 1960? Uh, this is 1959. Okay. Yeah. And is that the first time you met Fred Brooks? That was the first time I met Fred Brooks, yes. Uh, I mean, I knew of him. He'd been on the stretch program, and he'd been in, I've forgotten where else, but uh, that's all part of history. But he showed up on this audit team. <laughs> Later, we're going to run into Bob Evans. Did yes. you know Bob Evans at this time? Not then. Okay. Not then. I knew Bob Evans later quite well. Right. Yeah. Okay, so 1959, 60, and you're, you, uh, you were a member of a team or you were leading the team? I was, was leading the team to design this system, design the 7750. Okay, and terrific. Uh, and I ran into a bit of a personal problem uh, that led me to uh, resign from IBM and was planning to move back to California. Uh, and uh, the, as after I'd resigned, yes, handed my letter of resignation, uh, IBM, uh, offered me a position instead uh, of going to Paris. And in the end, we decided to do that. So I transferred from IBM in Poughkeepsie to IBM World Trade, uh, spent a little time in New York, and then moved to Paris uh, as part of the IBM World Trade Laboratories staff, of which there was one when I arrived, and I made two. <laughs> and my boss was Hal Martin, who I had known uh, earlier. Uh, because he was one of the recruiters that came to Caltech uh, to uh, recruit people when I was okay. interested. But are you saying you helped start what was basically the second World Trade Laboratory? No, uh, the World Trade Laboratories were already established. There were, I'm not sure if all of them were, but certainly there was one at Hursley in England had just gotten started then, about 1957 or eight. Uh, there was a Paris lab that had been uh, in operation since before World War II. There was a lab in Berlingen, Germany, uh, that I believe went back about that far as well. Oh, okay. I'm sure the one in Sweden was already established. 
so here were these at least four labs and uh, where there's another one. Well, there was one in Vienna later, but I'm not sure that one was there then. Anyway, there were at least four. Uh, I may have missed one somewhere. Uh, that were over there that IBM said, you know, we've got these labs over here and they're building stuff for Europe. Uh, we would like to, we've got to get these productive for the worldwide market because we're in the worldwide business. So that was kind of the mission of the World Trade Laboratories was to bring this group of uh, European labs into the world worldwide wide product development operation. And uh, so I went there. Uh, my initial assignments were to help Hal on, on trying to do some of those things. Uh, but I also had a particular, because I'd been associated with the airline reservations, uh, Sabre system, and my work on the 7750, and uh, the Europeans were just starting to try to get the airlines interested in, in uh, IBM World Trade, which sure. trying to get European airlines interested. So I helped out with uh, several of those. Uh, I guess the most notable one was with KLM uh, in Amsterdam, uh, where I went and spent, oh, I don't know, several months well, in up there. And instead of me showing them what to do, I learned <laughs> about it, airline reservation systems from a man by the name of Hank Asser, a, a senior systems uh, IBM Systems uh, man from... Uh, Could you say that name again or spell it? Asser, A-S-S-E-R. Hank, H-E-N-K. Hank Asser. And uh, Hank was one of the smartest guys I'd ever met. <laughs> and I had met him in Poughkeepsie. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to be able to work with him for several months. And he taught me the ins and outs of, uh, of uh, computer applications, airline reservations, uh, and how airline reservation systems actually worked. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a very, very fruitful experience for me. And then I went over and spent a similar amount of time in Ireland. We were working with uh, Aer Lingus uh, and uh, uh, tried to get both of them. I think eventually IBM did sell, uh, sell systems to both of them. We were trying to build airline reservations out of 1410s at that point. Yeah, we really never had a successful airline system until after 360, right? Well, you know, I don't know that we didn't have a successful one. Uh, that You may be right. I mean, it, well, uh, it, Whether those airlines built something before the 360, they might have. But the 360, yeah, made a lot of changes there. The, those, the 360 system was really uh, much better suited for that kind of thing. Whether there were actually n any su commercially successful systems uh, uh, before then, I, I can't say. Uh, anyway, I was in the Paris office of IBM World Trade Laboratories from the end of 1960, December 60, until about June, when uh, Hal, Martin, Hal Martin's boss was uh, Gardner Tucker. Gardner Tucker had taken over, recently taken over, and he was really concerned about the Hursley Laboratory and the uh, management and direction there. And uh, he uh, made some management changes and removed the, the laboratory director and uh, asked me if I would take that position. Well, I was a 29-year-old uh, kid. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, was so flattered, I couldn't say no. Uh, whether it was a wise thing for, for me to do, I don't know. Well, yes, I do know a little bit. I, I'll come back to that. Uh, anyway, I did accept that position and moved over there in June of 1962. Is that right? No, it's 1961. Okay. June, of 19, June July 1961. Okay. Uh, and uh, became head of the, of the laboratory. And what were some of the, how, how big was the laboratory and what were some of the projects the that you were doing? It was about four or five hundred people. It was a substantial lab and uh, a fairly heavy expense for, for IBM. Uh, they were working on, the, the main thing they were working on was the SCAMP computer. Uh, now SCAMP was the first computer in IBM that, uh, it, it, it claimed to fame was the use of read-only control memory 
to store the control, all the control operations for operating the computer itself. Prior to that, they were all hardwired. They were uh, hardwired logic. Uh, microcode? Is this they, first microcode? This is microcode. Right. So in a sense, uh, IBM, SCAMP, uh, put microcode on the map as far as IBM was concerned. Ah, very good. And obviously that was a key to 360. It was very important to 360. And it was the SCAMP that demonstrated its utility uh, it was, I don't, uh, IBM didn't invent this idea. It, it, I think it was invented by uh, Wilkes at Cambridge, uh, the idea of a microcoded computer. Uh, and I think they may have built one or two, but for a product, uh, the, this scamp machine was the first product, uh, proposed product. Now, scamp was not on the worldwide product list. It was potentially going to be a, a, a computer in Britain. Uh, maybe in world trade, nobody quite knew. Uh, along with that product was the development of the read-only memory technology uh, that, that allowed it to happen, allowed the microcode machine to work. So there was the basis for a microcoded, microcoding technology there and, the, the, and a computer that demonstrated this technology. <coughs> One of the first tasks that I was, major tasks that I was given, uh, of course as a 29 year old kid, American, walking into this scene in Britain where almost everybody was older than I, uh, certainly the, the senior managers were all, my age. John Fairclough who's well known, uh, there, he, he and I are the same age, uh, John's passed away unfortunately, but uh, he and I were the same age, but he was one of the younger ones too uh, among the managers there. So. I was not uh, uh, welcomed, let's put it that way. Uh, fortunately, that didn't last long. Uh, I was uh, pretty accepted pretty soon. But one of the most difficult things I had to do was to have the SCAMP product audited, uh, as looked at as a worldwide product. Was this going to be a worldwide product? Well, we had people in from the US and Europe and, and you know, a, a small group, which I was a member, on the audit committee uh, to decide whether this thing had a possibility of becoming a worldwide product. And we turned it down. We said, no, it didn't. It didn't fit with the 7000 series. It didn't fit with the uh, 1400 series, 1400 it didn't fit series. with anything else that was coming down the pike or beginning to be introduced uh, at the time. So we had to kill it, and this of course was a mortal blow to the Hursley lab, and uh, it uh, wasn't any fun administering it. Fortunately, the, uh, uh, the spread committee which was the foundation committee for laying out the ground rules uh, for the 360 series. Uh, fortunately, they uh, were just getting started. And uh, with the help of Gardner Tucker, who was the man who put me into this, in fact, I reported to Gardner with his help, we got John Fairclough on that committee. Ah. So that was one of the biggest personal, uh, personal steps forward, the fact that John was going to be on this thing. And, uh, and, and so he was detached from the lab for two or three months and came to the U.S. and served on that committee full time from then on. And had he worked on SCAMP? So oh, he yeah. Knew he micro oh, he was the manager of SCAMP. I'm sorry, ah. I should have made that clear. He Actually. was the manager of the SCAMP project, was very familiar with all the technology and all of the stuff ah, that had gone into excellent. it. Excellent. So he brought that with him. And I think he was able to convince them that this was the way to go on designing all but the very highest performance computers. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so uh, that's how I think the read-only memory uh, and the microcode got introduced in the 360 was because John was there. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, we began doing support work for some of the thoughts that were going on in that committee. Uh, we had uh, uh, a read-only memory group. Uh, uh, I established a read-only memory group under a, 
the senior manager, Peter Atkinson, and under him, Tony Proudman, who was uh, really a key. Tony was one of the keys to the evolution of read-only memories in IBM. Uh, and uh, on the other side, let's see, we, we got that started. And uh, uh, a man by the name of Tony Peacock was one of the bright young architectural people in, uh, in, in this, and had been instrumental in SCAMP. Uh, he was even younger than, than John and I. <laughs> and he was a very smart man. Uh, and he got started, he had a little team that, as I recall, it was supporting some of the thoughts they were having in the SCAMP committee doing feasibility studies for that sort of thing. So we kind of got ourselves into the middle of this uh, during, that, during that period. Have you ever mused on what would have happened if Fairclough with his SCAMP and microprogram knowledge hadn't gone to spread? I have never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it, I think it, it sounds like serendipity. It sounds like a sure. really excellent choice. Sure, yeah. So you were running the Hursley Lab. Yes. And we're in 62 now, and Spread says we're going to do it's 360. Do this. And, uh, and Hursley will get the Model 40, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I, I think John lobbied very hard to get the Model 40 yeah. And, uh, yeah. and got it. And I think he, that was the point, I think, where John made good friends with Bob Evans. Because okay. John and Bob were very close all throughout the rest of, of uh, John's, their careers, uh, as far as I remember. Yeah, they were good close friends. And, and uh, it was a good thing because Bob was in charge of the, of the development was made put in charge of the development of 360. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, yes, John, we got the Model 40. We also got the responsibility for uh, developing, initiating the development of all of the control stores, that is the microcode stores, uh, for all of the machines. Really? Yeah. Uh, <sighs> my memory is a little bit vague on this. The uh, the one that we had developed for, uh, we developed for the Model 40 came straight out of the SCAMP design. It was a transformer read-only store. Uh, very reliable, very stable, huge signal to noise ratios, and fortunately, uh, I can talk about this a little bit later, but we managed to get it into the controllers, uh, that particular design. Uh, and it just, because it was so reliable, it, it just made the controllers, the disk controllers, all of those units had control okay. stores in them. The and tape uh, and disk controllers and yeah, certainly the, certainly the disk ones controllers. And teleprocessing controllers, I'm sure, all had, had transformer read-only stores and they were extremely reliable. Hmm. We had some technologies under development that weren't so reliable. Uh, some that were very, uh, very fast. Uh, one of them was the car, the uh, Balanced capacitor read-only store, I think, is what it was called. It mm -hmm. went into the mm -hmm. Model 65, and I believe even the Model 70 I eventually adopted, or 60 and 65 adopted it. Uh, it it was it was faster. Uh, it was more complex and more expensive, uh, certainly more expensive per bit than the transformer read-only store. Uh, but it it was developed at at uh, Hursley also for the Model 65. Did you do the C-Cross for the Model 30? We did some work on the C-Cross. Uh, we didn't like it much because the signal to noise ratio was so low. Uh, an important element in any kind of signal where you're trying to detect signals is how big is the signal compared to all the other noise that's running around in there? Well, with a C-Cross at the time, I think they eventually improved the C-Cross, we were running one and a half to one. That means the signal is one and a half times as big as the noise. And that means you have to work very hard and pay a lot of money to build the amplifiers to reliably detect that signal and not to get confused by the noise. With a transform read-only store, it's about six to one. You know, it's so big mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. can't miss it. It just knocks you off the table when that signal comes through. So that's what made the transformer read-only store so, so useful. But the transformer read-only store was not as fast. And you couldn't change it by just slipping a card in and right. out. Right, right. Uh, well, eventually they give up the slipping the card in and out idea too. Uh, but Endicott was sold on that idea as a way of, well, we can quickly change the microcode, you know, by just putting the cards in and out. 
Well, it turned out it was much harder. You had to seal all those units, make Faraday cages out of the units so that the external noise didn't get in there and do a lot of work. So eventually, they paid a fairly heavy price to use that sea cross, uh, which I personally was involved in warning the management about. <laughs> and they eventually said to me, after I, just about the time I left, they said, you know, you were right. <laughs> Charlie Branscombe said that to me, you know, you were right. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, life in the, the real world, but, but my radar background, huh? But we're on the path now. Oh yeah, yeah, they were on the path now. Yeah. And, and uh, so uh, that's how it, it, it got started. Uh, and we de developed the Model 40 uh, and uh, released it and did the first uh, time a product had been released into Poughkeepsie from a foreign uh, from a foreign location. We did it using data over telephones and a lot of airline travel and and uh, got it built in Poughkeepsie and in Esson in France. I think it was Esson. Mm -hmm. There are two plants in France and I'm going to, uh, it may have been the other one, the one down south. I've forgotten where it is. Down, down near Marseille. Uh, but uh, the uh, it, we released it into production, uh, and uh, it was a pretty successful machine. Okay, well let's let's jump back just a little bit. We get to my favorite date in history, April seventh, uh, nineteen sixty-four. Yes. <laughs> and three hundred and sixty is announced, and yes. they announce uh, this uh, what six different models, yes. and um, and and help my memory here. But my memory is they announced that we would have software, not. Not even sure we said operating system, but we would have software that would support scores of different tasks going on, and there would be a control program that would manage all this and so on. And my memory is we only announced one. That is, 360 would have this software, period. Right. Was that the plan, or was is my memory bad? And well, so. Uh, you you were happened. a spectator from one point of view. I was a spectator from another because we were not directly involved at that point in the software for the 360. We had some work going on peripherally, uh, including some work that eventually led up to doing the PL1 compiler, if anybody can remember that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, after I left, that work was done there. But we had some work peripherally going on, feasibility studies, and yes, I think the original idea was one operating system, top to bottom. Well, uh, that idea uh, went on the rocks of not enough memory at the bottom to support the things that you had to do at the top. It just wasn't possible to take one system and have it actually be able to go over the whole range of memories. Uh, and that problem, uh, in my opinion, cost the IBM company uh, uh, an incredible amount of money. Incredible amount of money. So let me tell you from my point of view uh, how that struggle went. I trans at some point the folks in Endicott with the small machine decided they had to do, it started on their own system. I think they started work on it, you know, in the closet. Because there was supposed to be one for the whole 360 series. They'd started on some things as a result of the 1401, 1401G, is that right? 1401, what was the, the there were several models of the 1401 that were. Well, the 1460 was a follow on to the 1401 yeah. and the 1410 was a follow on. Yeah, but there was a thing called a 1401G also in there. I don't think the 1460 was on the, on the radar yet. I might be wrong about that, but I don't think it was. Uh, but they had several models of the 1401. They had a lot of experience with what those machines had to do and what their customers expected. And they just looked at this idea of a single operating system down there in Poughkeepsie of all places, <laughs> and uh, said, uh, you know, this is probably not going to work. So they started, I think, on their own. I, I think it was Jim Frame who was the head of the programming there. Yes. And probably John Hanstra. I don't know, I've forgotten whether John was there or not. Maybe Bob even had a legacy of Bob's work there. They started on their own on trying to develop, developing some ideas about how the the, uh, an operating system for the 360 would work for a small machine. That eventually became DOS. Right. Uh, 
I moved back from Hursley to White Plains uh, as deputy director of the labs. My boss, by then Byron Havens, had moved his office over to Nice. He knew what he was doing. Uh, he, <laughs> he operated from Nice in France, and uh, I went to White Plains. But I was so there. You're still in World Trade. Yes, I'm still in, in World Plains Trade now. But I'm in White Plains. Okay. I'm, I'm running the White Plains office of IBM World Trade Laboratories, and uh, it was a very small office. I mean, it was only six or eight people. But I was representing World Trade uh, Labs, and uh, he uh, uh, next door to me in the conference room in the building I was in one day there was this enormous meeting going on and I didn't know anything about it, I didn't know what it was. But I could hear the temperature rising as people were began to, began to shout at each other and, and uh, almost throw things. <laughs> and the argument was that IBM had split DOS and created DOS to run on the 8K and smaller machines. And Poughkeepsie had, was, had met with the Endicott folks in this conference room to tell them that they couldn't do the 16K one either. And that Endicott was gonna have, you know, some other way to find out to, to build a 16K machine because we couldn't get OS 360 into 16K. Well, I remember hearing that discussion. This was before I had any idea I was gonna be involved in OS 360. And uh, it was pretty, pretty, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, out of that came the extension of DOS up to 16K. I was, at the same time, uh, about that time, uh, the Systems Development Division was formed under John Hanstra, and John asked me to go to Poughkeepsie and take over OS 360. Uh, Fred Brooks was leaving to go to uh, University of North Carolina, and uh, they wanted me to, to take it over. Well, uh, it's, uh, here I was, I had done some programming. I had been involved a little bit in management of programming, but now I was gonna get thrown right in the middle of this thing. <laughs> and uh, so I said yes. <laughs> and uh, off I went to Poughkeepsie. Well, we got there and the major struggle uh, one of the major, uh, let me just continue this theme about the core memory and then we can come back to other parts of this, but one of the major struggles that we were facing was the 32K, uh, getting the system to run in 32K and still support bigger machines that had 128, 256 and even 512K, those sizes of memories were just unheard of in those days, but it, it, the system clearly had to perform at the 256K level. Uh, and to try to get that same system to run in 32K was an incredible struggle. Uh, we spent a year fighting that problem. An extra year in the schedule, I claim, for OS 360 was spent trying to hit that 32K memory size. Mm -hmm. And we <coughs> couldn't get anybody to listen about giving up on that. Uh, the only people who gave up on it quickly and, and happily were the customers. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't going to give up on it. And we spent about, I think, about a year of extra time uh, struggling with the operating system to get it to run on the 32K system. I remember, for example, having a conversation, sitting in my office in Poughkeepsie quite late in the evening, 8 o'clock maybe, talking to San Jose. And they were building the assemblers in San Jose, and the, the assembler that was supposed to run on 32K, I guess that's called a, there was a, num a letter for the si memory sizes, a G or a H or something, whatever it was, the one that was supposed mm -hmm. to run in 32K. We said, uh, the operating system, we said 32K, half of that is the operating system, and the other half of that is the application program, like the assembler. So you gotta fit, and, and then I had a, I had one and a half K of of fudge in the middle. So when I allocated the sizes out, I gave them 14 and a half K or something like that. Said, you've got to fit in 14 and a half K. Well, in order to fit a big program like an assembler in 14 and a half K, you have to bring it in in stages. You have to do this part and then you roll that out and bring another one in. I talked to, gosh, I wish I could remember his name. There was a manager of that operation in San Jose on the phone. 
And he said to me, well, we now have 95 loads of the assembler to get into 14 and a half K. But I've got one phase that's 15 and a half K. Do I have to split it? And, and <laughs> of course, once you split this thing, you've got so much interphase logic. In order for this phase to hand over its stuff to the next one and the next one to pick it up, you've got a, so much overhead in that that, phew. Anyway, uh, we agonized for about an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, do we have to do it? Da -da 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 -da. And finally, I said, yeah, you've got to split it. So they split it. And he calls me back the next day and he says, well, now it's down to two phases, one of which is 15K and the other <laughs> which is 14 and a half. Do I have to split that 15K one too? Oh. <laughs> uh, I've forgotten how we exactly resolved <laughs> that. But the point was we were just, you know, and it was every like that. Every, all of those applications, all those compilers were up against the same issue. The assembler was probably as bad as any. It was a very sophisticated assembler. And, uh, so it was probably, uh, you can just see what was going on here. Uh, so what quickly happened with the memory problem was as we shipped this stuff into the field, the customers quickly figured out that 32K just didn't give you anything. And the Model 40s for who this uh, lower end operating system was really aimed quickly added either another 32K or one all the way to 128K, just like that. And they didn't bat an eyelash, and then they got the advantage of all the other stuff. So, so like I said earlier, it was only IBM management that <laughs> couldn't figure out that, that uh, 32K wasn't going to be very effective. Yeah, for it them. really was not, it, it was both a problem and an opportunity because we benefited from the revenue of all that extra memory, and yeah. it wasn't that bad. Customers understood the problem. Yeah. Yeah, they do. But yeah, they if do. I can, let's go back to um, you. You leave Hursley, and John Fairclough takes over yes, your he does. job. Yes, John took over my job. Took and over now you come to Poughkeepsee yes. in the middle of 1960. I came in, in 64. I came back to the World Trade Headquarters job in White Plains in 64, and went to OS 360 in early 65. In 65. Yes. And um, according to Emerson Pugh, Bob Evans asked for yes. you by name. I never heard that before I read it in Evans, oh, okay. Emerson Pugh's book. <laughs> okay. But be that as it may, you got the project. And yes. how many programmers are on, because we're going we're to be talking about Fred Brooks now, so how many programmers are on the project at this time? Uh, well, certainly hundreds. I'm, uh, I don't know why I think it, it, it might have approached a thousand, but I don't believe is a, in retrospect that that could have been the case. I would imagine it was three, four, five hundred. It was a really big program. That's, that's big. But we had 30, as I recall, 30, 30 some odd comp different components of the operating system, including mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. pieces of the, uh, I'm sorry, thir components under OS 360, which was more than just the operating system, all the compilers and the utility programs and, and then various uh, different operating systems uh, that operated in different ways. We had the, the uh, uh, PCP, Principal Control Program, I think it was called PCP, which was the basic 32K one. Yep. And then the yep. MFT, which was the uh, multi, uh, was, was multi-programming operating system that was based on fixed tasks. Right. And then uh, later, uh, we eventually got MVT working. So we were had, the when you were there, the decision had already been made to separate out and make PCP available first? Yes. Okay. By the time, I think that was made before I got there. Okay. I think Carl Reynolds, who was my boss, made the decision to get PCP out first. And okay. that's what we focused on, was getting the PCP done so they could support all those Model 40s. And I have to add that a lot of people kept their old equipment longer. <laughs> I remember. And paid rental um, because they weren't able to do the work they wanted with PCP, but at least they were there and they did get started and it, yeah. it, it was did so what it had to do. Yeah, the, uh, that, that, that is true. I remember going to a meeting in White Plains uh, where they were ranting and raving about the delays in the schedule of the OS, da da da, da and you know, what could you say? Hey, here's what's happening. 
Uh, and, uh, and then after the meeting, uh, and I, gosh, I wish I could remember his name. He later became president of IBM. Uh, if you can remember before, Carrie, uh, uh, Opal Acres? Before Carrie. Who was before Carrie? Uh, Vin Learson. Well, was Learson, was it then Carrie? Pardon me? Was it Carrie after Learson? I, that's my memory. <laughs> okay, how about <laughs> after that? John Opal. Opal. John Opal, who was on the staff at the time. One of the smartest guys I ever, ever met. I have a great admiration for John Opal. Uh, and he sat down with me and I think Carl Reynolds, just the three of us. And he says, you know, he says, we can cry all the way to the bank on this delay. <laughs> he says, it just means they're paying rent on all those old machines <laughs> forever. Could we take a break? Yeah. Do you mind taking a break? No, let's take a break. Okay, good. That's excellent. So it's the, um, it's early in 65, and yes. we're supposed to be delivering MVT in the end of 65. No, it was MVS uh, at that didn't point. Didn't have that name, I don't think. It was MVS. Time. There was no MVT at that point. I'll talk about MVT and how right. it got there. The, uh, functionally, it was going to be. It was MVS, was called. Well, MVS, well, okay, you call it MVS at that time? That's what they called it. Oh, okay. Before I got there, it was the MVS system that was. Oh, okay. Because MVS ones. was the official name later, wasn't it? That was later. Yes. That's right. So, but they started off with MVS and then came back to it later. Oh, okay. Um, we can talk about but that. But the decision had been made to uh, split off DOS first of all. Not yes. To split off, but yes. that solved the problem for yes. the whole end and to create PCP as an interim yes. step. Yes. And so those are going on. And, um, and, and you've got about 500 people. And this is the time when I think that led Fred Brooks to his whole Mythical Man Month book and the idea that you can't add more programmers to a big project and make it faster. Right. That's a slight overstatement. That's correct. No, is that's that pretty your close. experience? And is that's that pretty close. what I happened agree to with you? Him. Yeah, I agree with him. I agree. I didn't understand that at the time. I don't think he did either, by the way, at the time. Right. I think it's on reflection, this is where you get to. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's very tempting to add more people and imagine that you can somehow, but unless you do it very carefully, you destroy the integrity of the organization, the uh, relationships in the organization, and uh, so you make it dysfunctional make the organization dysfunctional by adding more people to it and until it regroups and puts itself back together you've lost a lot of stuff so that's really what he's driving at and yes it's true <laughs> uh, you ought to start out with what you how you uh, what you plan to go with and stick with it any other observations from just that year of 1965 about leading a huge programming project uh, I don't know whether I'd have any general observations. I think at the time we had so little understanding of process in the software business. I'm not sure we had that much understanding of process in the hardware business, but it always, it always led the software. Software was not, software is thought to be a craft, uh, an art, uh, you know, that uh, you can't, uh, you, you, it wasn't an engineering practice. Yes. And a lot of what was done later, Watts Humphrey was a particular contributor to this. He wrote books about, about process. But the idea that software, developing software is an engineering practice and you ought to follow engineering principles was late in coming. And it certainly wasn't part of what uh, we were involved in. I have heard it said by a wise guy who had a good observation from the outside, Tom Simpson. Did you ever hear of Tom Simpson? I don't think so. Tom was a very, very smart guy, uh, field uh, programming guy, wrote a lot of interesting software for the 360 and I think before that. He told me once that he came, when he came to Poughkeepsie, he said it was uh, really interesting. He said, here were all these external specifications for these various different components, you know, the compiler, this compiler, and that assembler, and that phase, and this thing. I had good, quite good external specs that had all been written by very capable programmers. 
And then he said the capable programmers disappeared and they were asking kids who just, you know, just out of college to write the code. Uh, we were asking that. We were asking kids, to, you know, who just, uh, you know, to write the code. So he said it's no wonder they got in trouble because <laughs> he was a big advocate of using very experienced people to write all the code too. So that, that's one thing that I think is, uh, it's another sort of observation that is in a way uh, consistent with what Brooks mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, <coughs> no, I think we, it, it, it's easy to try to keep pushing very hard to get things to happen faster. And I guess everybody in the software business does it. And I mean, even today, <laughs> it's not un unclear. <laughs> that, that, uh, and and you, you make a lot of mistakes. That's the other thing that happens. People make mistakes. And uh, it's easy to make a mistake in, in, in design. Uh, uh, and a mis mistake in design is really, really hard to fix because you've got to go back and fix the design and fix all the code and all that stuff. And, and so in general, not nearly enough time was spent on the front end of uh, uh, trying to decide what's the right thing to do and what are all the things you need to do. And that's a very hard thing to do anyway. Uh, but it means you've got the right specifications that not only programmers can understand, but that people who are going to be involved with, with using and selling and dealing with the customers, uh, that they can understand and say, hey, this isn't going to work, you know. And that's very hard to do. That, that whole combination of things is a hard, hard darn thing to do. But that's what good external specifications do and good engineering practice would say. And if you get that right, once you get that right, you can, you can code. Coding is pretty easy stuff frankly, if you know exactly what you're doing and why. So uh, I've long since learned that external specs and internal specs are really important because once you've got those done, the code, you can go home and code in your bathtub, you know, and it'll come out just fine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, TSS, or time sharing, was another yeah. big yeah. problem. <laughs> yes. Were you involved in that? No, I was not. Uh, it was always, uh, the TSS was done on the side to support, as I recall, uh, a couple of different, uh, m mostly university yeah. locations. Yeah. MIT, Michigan figure big in my memory about why we did TSS. Uh, the, and, and it, in a way, we thought it took resources away from <laughs> OS that we wished we'd had. Uh, we eventually did a time-sharing, and I've even forgotten what it was called, a time-sharing option. On TSO. TSO. Time-sharing yeah, option, part of MVS. Part of, part of MVS, yeah, I guess it was. I know that was on the drawing board when I left, but yeah, I don't think we'd done it. We hadn't done anything with it. Mm -hmm. uh, no, so that's, uh, yeah. You want to... An interesting story, if you want to talk about it, is the MVS story. Okay. Uh, <coughs> because MVS envisioned... Is this the first use of MVS? The first the use of MVS. Okay. The first MVS envisaged a completely flexible use of memory. Remember that PCP only had one, one partition. partition. MFT had multiple partitions, but they were partitions, and you ran different programs in different partitions. And you genned them, and they were fixed. That's right. You genned them, and they were fixed. MVT allowed you to have partitions that were variable, uh, but MVS was a completely fluid uh, mechanism, a la 370, and the later MVS envisaged running on the 360 architecture. Now, what became very clear uh, as we moved into getting PCP done. We had a small group under a man by the name of Larry Cohn. I've mentioned his name before, I think. Very smart guy. And Larry had come to the realization that all this variability uh, in memory, the being able to flexibly load anywhere, anytime, required that the components, the compilers and the assemblers, adhere to certain rules. Well, they hadn't. The rules may have been written someplace, but nobody said, this is what you got to do. And as a consequence, they weren't built for that. Reentrant code. 
uh, yes, reentrant code uh, and, and the ability to relocate, uh, freely relocate these things uh, anywhere was, had to be built into the, into the code. Well, you couldn't do that. That's really hard, first of all, to get everybody to follow the rules, and the rules are difficult, and then to test all those rules and make sure they're doing it right. And so it became clear that it wasn't going to be feasible. And in fact, it wasn't feasible until you had the full, full relocation hardware that came along with the 370, mm -hmm. and the hardware does it for mm -hmm. you. So that was the big contribution of 370, was to solve that problem. Okay. Uh, Anyway, we had a big uh, come to Jesus <laughs> about what we were going to do about M MVS. And I can remember sitting in my office in Poughkeepsie saying, uh, Larry Cohn is very unhappy. Scott Locken was the head of the operating system, and Cohn worked for Locken. Uh, and Cohn is C-O-H-N? C-O-H-N, yes. And Locken is? L-O-C-K-E-N. Thank you. Scott Locken and Larry Cohn. Uh, Larry Cohn's out here somewhere in California now. I sort of run into him on one occasion. Anyway, uh, the uh, we sat in in my office and I said, "Look, if you can't do MVS, can't we do something where we can have memory spaces that uh, themselves can be moved?" Uh, so that it's flexible, not fixed like MFT, and get most of the way where you want to go. Well, we argued about that uh, and, and debated whether that could be done. Uh, I think that was the first discussion we ever had about an MVT, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which eventually got, uh, got to be part of the operating system. And MVT. a very important part. Yeah, it was a very important part. It MFT ultimately went away, I think. And really? And I maybe didn't know not. that. I, I didn't know that. Uh, but MVT, certainly for the big systems, was a very important part of it. And uh, it was a compromise. Uh, we just couldn't do uh, with what we had we, and uh, what, what we wanted to do or what had originally been, been planned. So that's how MVT got on the map. Uh, we, uh, so that ultimately the idea of having to abandon the MVS and go to MVT started in your office? As far as I know, yes. And did it end there? I'm sure you, we had you to made take the decision. It. We carried that decision up the line, and f you know, I'm sure that uh, they could have fired me <laughs> and tried to do the other thing, but they didn't. <laughs> uh, yes, I think we fought for it and said that's what we're going to do, and you're going to have to go back and tell the customers that uh, it's going to be this way instead of that way, <laughs> and uh, we had to do quite a lot of that because about the time. Uh, we got a maybe <coughs> six or s months or so uh, after I arrived, it became clear that we simply could not deliver this plethora of product on the schedules that had been promised. Uh, it, it, uh, it wasn't going to work. And so we had to sit down and try to take apart everything that had to be done and look at all the relationships between the components and figure out what we were going to do first and how long it was going to take. And one of the lessons, I guess this is another observation that uh, I need to make. One of the problems is that you have a group working on a particular product, and they're scheduled to work on another one as soon as that one's finished, and then they're scheduled to work on yet another one. So you've got one, two, three, maybe four things that have to be done in a row. And when you try to plan something like that, uh, you typically add contingency into the schedule. Uh, if you want to be sure. expect to get it. And you have to observe that these contingencies are cumulative, so that if you've got a contingency on this one to finish here, when you go to do the next one, because it, the contingency applies to the time, uh, to the time, not to the effort itself. Uh, this was an idea that I think I did come up with. It said, hey, you've got to apply the contingency to the time so that when you start it later, you've got to put a bigger contingency on it because you're unsure about when you're going to get this team off here. Even though you put contingency on doing that, uh, w when you start that one, you're unsure because you don't know when you're going to finish. So we built the schedules that way very carefully. Uh, I had a small staff, a wonderful woman who I cannot remember her name, uh, 
she had been an, been an army officer and uh, had been in programming. He was a, you know, a strong old hand programmer and, and really good. Uh, Larry Foster, who was mentioned in the, in the uh, Emerson Pugh book, uh, was on my staff there. Uh, and and uh, Crowley, Dave Crowley. Uh, th there was, oh, and Ted, Ted Klimas who's a well-known name. And <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think it was those four. Uh, Ted wasn't doing much of the planning, but uh, he was doing a lot of the interfacing to the outside world. Uh, he's the only guy, in the <laughs> only guy I ever knew to, who could, could you ask him a question and he's unsure of the answer. And he starts immediately launching off into what, if you're not careful, you think is the answer. And you realize that, it, that you know, you're getting 30 seconds of gobbledygook while he's thinking up here. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the answer starts to arrive and he doesn't even give you the signal when the answer <laughs> arrives. He, just, uh, he was a wonderfully talented guy. Uh, I, I believe he passed away. Uh, yes, he, he was out here running uh, part of GPD. Okay. Just, yeah. But yeah. anyway. He was a very talented guy. And he, uh, the, uh, anyway, we started to lay out these schedules, and boy, the times just went out, you know. The time arrival for MVS was in release 12 now, and release 12 was two and a half years late or something. We laid all this out and started to take it up the line. And uh, of course, there was all kinds of flack. The group, group staff uh, just, you know, they couldn't believe it. And eventually we had a meeting in a uh, conference room in Poughkeepsie. And lo and behold, Vin Learson showed up for that meeting. I'm sorry, who? Vin Learson. Oh, yes. Uh, I knew Learson slightly, but the first time I really run into him <laughs> was when he came up to listen to my pitch on the OS 360 schedules. And the uh, and, and so I, I laid it out and explained everything, walked through all the details, this, this, and this, and, and uh, you know, here, here's 30, 30 or 40 components all scheduled out over a three or four year period. <laughs> and uh, yes, it was late. <laughs> and one of the group staff guys, <laughs> after I'd finished, said, why does that Fortran take so long? <laughs> and I looked at the looked up at the chart and I just explained why and I said because I say that's how long it takes <laughs> <laughs> nobody said a word and we walked out of there and that was the schedule that uh, that was put down that was the schedule that became official and as far as I know we never missed any more schedules after that that was probably I mean, you may know better than I but that was probably in 1966 65, 60, 66 probably, we laid that down the new set of schedules. Yeah. yeah. And, and we didn't miss any, they didn't miss any more. Middle 66 or early 66? Yeah. We don't, I don't think we missed any more. We got them on, we, you know, once we laid it out so it could get mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, it, people got, we got it done. Now, often IBM executives get a chance to explain not just to other IBM executives, but to our customers. Oh yes, what's going on? <laughs> Did you get any of those? Oh yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did a number of uh, the most memorable ones were the, at the share meetings, and the most memorable one of those was someplace in was it upstate New York? I don't remember where it was. It was no, it must have been. So <laughs> SHARE was the big scientific customers. Yes, it was the 7,000, 7090, 7094, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 360 model 65s, <laughs> et cetera. And the big issue at the time was uh, COBOL, FORTRAN, and PL1. And of course, uh, SHARE had participated in the design of PL1, uh, which was uh, a good idea to try to get a language. I mean, they got an architecture that bridged the scientific and commercial uh, realms that everybody would accept, and now they wanted to try to find a language that would do the same thing. Well, 
no one will ever know, I certainly don't, whether that was possible. But what was clear was that Share was involved, IBM was involved, a lot of smart people involved. Uh, Hersley Lab was right in the middle of it. They built the first uh, PL1 compiler. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, uh, but it got really elaborate. Uh, you know, as Fred Brooks would say, gargoyles and all, you know, <laughs> in, in the process. And I think it really suffered from not having the integrity of design that comes from somebody who, or a very small group of people who are really sitting on top of it with a clear vision of what they're trying to do. Uh, and, uh, that's my impression anyway. Mm -hmm. And my impression, I, I was close enough to probably have a pretty good impression. Uh, but I don't think there was anything like that integrity. Uh, people added stuff on because it seemed like a good idea. And as far as I know, I don't know what's happened to PL1. I don't know if anybody uses it anymore at all. Uh, Actually, as a quick aside, uh, I ran into it because I worked at Santa Teresa Labs, and Santa Teresa Lab had responsibility for PL1 at the time I okay. was there, and then ended up sending it back to Hersley. <laughs> uh, but yes, it was. Uh, uh, it certainly never did replace yeah. Fortran or Cobol, but no. it had a role. No, I'm sure it did, and I and don't know whether they're still in use. Numbers. Fortran or Cobol certainly are. Uh, <coughs> and uh, but the big argument in the share committee was, what are you going to do about Cobol? And are you going to keep COBOL, or are you going to drop it? You know, and I, I, uh, I've forgotten exactly what I, I was working off talking points that were provided to me by policymakers, <laughs> and I think I got up and suggested we were probably going to drop COBOL, and the uh, people hit the ceiling. Oh, uh, so I got on the phone back to the headquarters. I said, you know, this isn't going to fly. <laughs> So I had to go back out and correct myself and said, no, we're not going to drop COBOL, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to keep going with PL1. <laughs> that was uh, quite painful. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of trouble with testing. Uh, testing software, is that okay? Uh, place oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember going to one of the share meetings and having somebody say to me, well, I've just installed, I installed PCP and I did X, Y, Z on the keyboard, <laughs> and the machine crashed. Did you guys test anything? I can't tell you how many hours and hours and hours of <laughs> testing we did, oh. how much stuff we <laughs> tested, and, and product test was working at it too. Yeah. Oh my Lord, so here, uh, this guy just says, the first thing I tried was, you know, some, something he probably knew about. One day. <laughs> and <laughs> boom, the machine crashed. And I thought, yeah, well, there we are. Uh, so we had lots of trouble with testing. Uh, and a very big problem, uh, it's true in any testing any big system, uh, uh, long since found it and had to correct it in other people, <laughs> is, is the fact that, that if you aren't careful, it's easy to have the code get worse rather than better when you add changes. And uh, it's called regression. And uh, yeah. we ran into a lot of trouble with regression, code regression in OS, but we also had very strict controls. Scotty Locken, who worked for me as the head of the operating system, was very conscious of this, and he had very strict rules on what changes could be added and how they should be added, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we suffered from that, but not as badly as we might have. But I remember going as manager of OS 360, going back to Hursley on a visit and listening to their discussion about the development of the PL1 compiler. And they were having incredible regression problems. Uh, and I, I, had, I had learned from Locke and he, he taught me, uh, uh, he taught his boss about the right things to do. So I said, oh, you're having these regression problems. Uh, and they took me out and showed me they said, Yesterday, here's a board with the cards on it of the outstanding problems. Here are the new ones. Here are the ones that have come back, you know, on this side. And I said, wow. And then, you know, it's a whole board full of cards. Yeah, these, these came back last night. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, so I said, uh, how do you uh, control the code? Oh, well, it, it's kept, uh, it, it's a stack of cards. It was cards, you know, yep. big yep. stacks of cards, stacks oh, yes. of cards. 
in a secure place, uh, you know, in a special room that uh, you have to go in and, and, and make the changes in there. And I said, okay. Uh, and, and when you make the changes, does anybody pay any attention to what you're doing? Oh, yes, yes, we look those over very carefully. I said, uh, do you lock the room at night? <laughs> and they said, no. I said, uh, how do you know people aren't going in there in the middle of the night and making changes that you don't know about? Well, we don't know for sure. I said, look, you've got to fix this. <laughs> you've either got to have somebody in duty all night long, or you've got to lock that room up so nobody can get to it in the middle of the night, because your programmers are going to go in there and try to fix things. <laughs> and they did it. They locked it at night. And the regression just dropped to practically <laughs> zero. It was amazing. <laughs> But I only changed one card. Yeah, I only changed one card and <laughs> dropped the whole system down. Oh, yeah. It's still a problem. Uh, You've got to be real careful about regression. It's sure. a very, very nasty problem in, in software development. Yeah. Well, you reset the plan, and you, uh, we ended up meeting the schedules. Yes. And IBM certainly suffered some reputation, but really not financially, except we put a whole lot of money into building the operating system. Yeah, they did. And now we're at what, about the end of 66 maybe? Yes. And you're going to leave IBM uh, pretty I decided, soon. Yeah, I decided to leave. I, was, I left in June of 67. Yet two things happened. One of them, I was, uh, uh, in retrospect, I'm sure I was burned out. It has been a really tough go. And I didn't recognize that, uh, which is uh, uh, something that, uh, You've got to be much more mature than I was then, for sure, <laughs> to recognize that it was me having a problem. Uh, and I looked at all of the, where were the jobs up there that I might move to or around that were really interesting. And I thought, I don't see any jobs up there that appeal to me that much. Hmm. Uh, I thought the systems managers, which were the next real step up from where I was, had a terrible job. They had to fight the political battles all the time, and I just didn't like that. Uh, what I didn't understand was myself, and realized that, first of all, I don't like politics a great deal. Uh, I'm a pretty good engineer, and if I had been smart, I think I would have said, look, I want, I'm, I've done enough of this job. I would like to get back into some good, solid technical design work, especially architectural systems design, was, which was really what I was good at. And, uh, and if I'd done that, it might have, things might have taken a different course. Uh, mm. But I wasn't uh, uh, mature enough, I think, to see that. So I decided to leave IBM. I had made good friends in England uh, when I was there and had pretty good connections, and we decided to, decided to start a consulting company. So I left IBM and uh, went to England in 1967 and was over there with a little company, a little consulting company called T.C. Hudson Associates. I'm sorry, a little company called? T.C. Hudson Associates. Tom Hudson uh, had been IBM director of IBM UK, had been. And uh, he and I f formed a little consulting business and uh, consulted on, I, I did most of my work on, on operating systems and software and some hardware uh, uh, with computer companies and telephone companies and the UK government a bit. And, uh, and I was there for five years. Uh, so is that like 67 to 72 roughly? Yeah, 72, right. And in 72, I decided I ought to bring my family and kids back to California where they, where we had, I had started and my then wife uh, uh, was from. And uh, so I took a job with a little company called WaveTech down in San Diego. Now WaveTech is a quite a well-known instrument manufacturer, still important in small instruments, frequency generators and signal generators and stuff like that. But they decided they wanted to go into the audio response 
business. Hmm. The IBM's, what was it, 7770? 7770, compete with the 7770. And the first thing they did was get a, they got hold of a design done at the University of Utah, I think, in Logan, for a 7770 copycat, one that was, uh, uh, would, you know, behave like a, uh, com compatible with a 7770. And uh, so they had done that. And they had sold several of those. And one particular car, they were based in San Diego. And one of their most important customers was Roar Aircraft, R-O-H-R, -R, uh, who built uh, components for aircraft, aircraft components, military stuff. Uh, and the, uh, so they built that and, and they, what they then wanted to do was to build a much more general purpose kind of audio response unit. So I came in to run this little division uh, doing this, and this little division was, you know, 10, 15 people, and uh, mm, a couple of engineers and me. <laughs> and so we decided to uh, base the, our version on the PDP-11, which had just come out, really mm -hmm. nifty machine. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a, in, in, in a way, similar in the structure to the 7750. It had it was an own, its own computer. In this case, it was a PDP-11, plus the logic to do all the audio stuff. And uh, I designed the operating system for it. Uh, you had its own operating system because of the applica very application-centered in, in doing audio response. Uh, designed that and we built it and it worked <laughs> and uh, we also had to uh, do the software to work on a 370 channel. Uh, 370 channels are different from 360 channels mm -hmm. by the way mm -hmm. <laughs> in some interesting ways uh, and uh, I uh, w so we we had all the logic in there the the old machine worked on a 360 channel but the 370 channel had some different characteristics that uh, uh, we wanted the new system to work on. And we were testing in the ROAR, used the ROAR facilities for testing because we didn't, couldn't afford our own 370s. <laughs> uh, and uh, I remember one Sunday morning, I think it was, that we hit a real bug in our system uh, on the 370 channel. It just wouldn't work. Something wasn't working. So I thought, what in the world do we do here? So I picked up the phone. <laughs> And I called Watts Humphrey, who was an old <laughs> friend of mine. He was my boss in yeah, IBM. Yeah. Had been my boss, and he was head of Endicott by that point, head of the Endicott lab. And I called him in Endicott, and said, uh, "Watts, I need some help." <laughs> so I'm working for this little company. Da 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 da. We're trying to attach to a 370 channel, and we are having trouble uh, because we think we understand the 360 architecture, but there's something else going on here. And I expected to have him say, well, that's nice, <laughs> hang up on me. <laughs> yeah, good luck. And he didn't. <laughs> he said, okay. He, he, I took, he took my phone number, so I'll call you back. And so he did in about half an hour. This is Sunday morning. And uh, he called me back in about half an hour, and he said, I'm going to put you in touch with so-and-so. And, and he gave me his name, an engineer, and uh, see if he can't help you. Wow. So I got in touch with him. I think I phoned him. And... Uh, I explained to him what was going on, what we were doing, what we were doing. He says, oh, yeah, uh, if you wanted to do this, then you got to do X and Y and Z instead of the UVW that you were doing. And uh, I really appreciated that because we went back and we were able, in a matter of 15 minutes, change it to do X and Y and Z. <laughs> and it all worked. <laughs> <laughs> But I was really appreciative of the fact that. Uh, well, yeah, that's that terrific for you, and very, uh, very, very gentlemanly of gentlemanly uh, of IBM to do that, because okay. they might very well have just said, you know, that's tough luck if you can't figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And so you got your audio response unit working. Yep, we got it working. Uh, we sold it a little bit. We were kind of. It was 20 years before at the time. Was the one of the problems with it. this is 1974. Three four. And it was 20 years before its time because by 19, you know, there were not very many people were using that stuff. The banks, a few banks, uh, they were the big potential customers. Uh, the uh, but 
but we didn't, not a big enough base. We had some competition, an outfit by the name of Paraphonics also built uh, audio response systems, and they were a bit ahead of us in, uh, in, in time and in capability. And uh, IBM, of course, still had the 7770, as far as I know, that I don't think they exploited that very much at the time, because I don't think they thought it was a very big business. I think they might have sold a couple of hundred 7770s. Exactly. And that was nothing for IBM. Uh, so we were 20 years ahead of our time, and we were a little company, and essentially we ran out of money <laughs> and gave it up. <laughs> so I spent a, uh, a year uh, doing some consulting in San Diego, uh, in and around San Diego, and, and in other places, but from San Diego. And then I got an offer to join TRW. The TRW, bless its cotton socks, you think of TRW with rockets and spacecraft and all that sort of thing. Well, they bought our, <laughs> they wanted to get in the retail systems business. And they bought a company that was building point-of-sale uh, systems mm -hmm. for the May Company. The May Company owned this thing, and the May uh -huh. Company decided they wanted to get out of that business because <laughs> it was too complicated for a, for a, a, a department store operate, a management to run. So they sold it to TRW, and they had a lab in San Diego, which I took over and ran, and we designed uh, a, a, a we, they had one retail system, but we wanted to build a more effective one, so we designed and built one of those and struggled to get it installed, and, and uh, eh, it went all right, but I think they eventually sold that to Fujitsu, uh, who I think is possibly still in this retail systems business. I don't know. B IBM yeah. ended up selling its retail systems, too, yeah. to a Japanese company, and yeah. I think it may have been Fujitsu. Might but have been. anyway. Yeah. Anyway, in 1978, uh, I got an offer to come to Amdahl as vice president of software. And I did. That's when I moved from, uh, actually, I had moved by that time to Los Angeles. Uh, and. Uh, because the, 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 the sort of headquarters operation for this retail systems was actually in LA, in Hawthorne. And uh, I moved up there. Uh, and uh, let me think here for a minute. Yeah, in 78, I, I moved to, uh, up here to, uh, to Amdahl. OK, well, Gene Amdahl, of course, had, was a famous IBM right. guy, an architect of 360 and right. so on. Right. And in 1970, he started his own company, but, but for a number of reasons, ended up getting an awful lot of Fujitsu involved yes. in yes. Uh, Amdahl. So, yes. so at the time you joined Amdahl, Fujitsu was a big... Already a 49% owner. Yeah. yeah. The way Gene tells the story is that uh, he couldn't get anybody else interested in, in supporting this idea of compatible machines. And eventually in, uh, uh, went to Fujitsu to see if they would do it, and they agreed to do it. As they were interested in that compatible market themselves. But also by this time, it's, it's uh, somewhat... The machines at least are successful. I don't know about the finances, but he's... Yeah. He's making a big impact. The 470 was a very successful machine in its day. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. was running, at that time, MVS. Yes. Right? MVS, that's right. Okay, so you come into that environment. Right. And, uh, and what was your job? So I was vice president of software. And the question was, what do we do in software? Uh, we had done several things in software to emulate hardware features of the 370. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have trouble remembering the name of one of them. It had been, the software had been developed before I got there. Uh, we also developed some VM, uh, VM assist. These were assist things, mm -hmm. assisted mm -hmm. VM and MVS. So these were really things that, that filled in the compatibility gaps between the Amdahl machines and the IBM machines. We also had, going on under the covers, down where nobody could see it, a development of Unix on the 370. Mm -hmm. And uh, that 
was quite interesting to the telephone company, to AT&T, because they were Unix folks, if you remember, they invented it, and, and they were big on it. So, and IBM had several Unix installations on 370s, because they had a Unix, I've forgotten what they called it, uh, ATX, uh, I don't remember what IBM called their Unix. Uh, we called ours UTS. The Unix that they ended up putting out on a smaller, like a RISC system, was mm -hmm. called AIX. But I don't recall a Unix on a large system. Yeah, they had Unix on a large that system, maybe too. And, but it turns out that UTS, that we, the Amdahl UTS was, uh, I think because of the features and the flexibility, and I'm not sure of all the reasons why AT&T liked it better. And we sold a number of systems uh, Amdahl systems with UTS on it uh, to AT&T, perhaps 30 or 40, and at the rate of maybe 10 a year. Uh, yeah. Maybe 10 a year, maybe maybe even a little more uh, from time to time. Uh, and they, and from that point of view, it was a small project for us. It was uh, well, it wasn't small for us, but it was a small project, maybe 15 people. And for 15 people to sell 10 or 15 big systems, uh, it was uh, worth it. Yes. <coughs> the, uh, so that was another thing that we did in software. Was Fujitsu a help or a problem or just a non-factor for you, for, for the UTS? For UTS. And you? I don't think they were a factor very much. They were sort of interested in what we were doing, but they were much more interested in the MBS side of things. Was Gene um, Amdahl a factor for, for you personally? Gene Amdahl was only a factor for me at uh, Amdahl for a week. <laughs> because he left the day I joined, he left a week after I joined. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I never, even though I knew I Gene Amdahl perfectly well and from IBM, uh, we never had much interaction at yeah. Amdahl. He left, I think. Uh, uh, he had some personal reasons for doing it. Okay, so well he was not a factor. Uh, he was a factor in something we attempted to do, which was to design an operating system that was like MVS. Uh, and we had to put it together a small group. It was called Aspen. ASPEN, uh, like the mountains, uh, like the like the town in the mountains, uh -huh. uh, and uh, to, it was a system that that um, was uh, we thought a lot more interesting and flexible than MVS, and it had an MVS emulation capability. You could run MVS programs under it, but it really uh, foundered because IBM violently objected. Uh, to the MBS facility that we were doing. Didn't believe it wasn't stolen, which it wasn't. <laughs> uh, they had had trouble with code that was stolen. Uh, we heard rumors, uh, I, I don't have any firsthand evidence, but we heard rumors that, uh, that Fujitsu got in a lot of trouble for, for uh, with IBM. Yeah, there was something there. I don't know, I don't remember the details. I don't remember yeah. the details either, but there was, uh, I, I've even heard of examples of things that were found in the Fujitsu code that were giveaways. I think there was even a settlement. Yes, some kind there might have been. Financial anyway, settlement. they threatened Amdahl, uh, with a, and, and so we dropped that project. Uh, I'm not so sure it was as wise an idea as we originally thought it was, but it was Gene Amdahl's idea. I remember that Gene, in, the, in that very week or two that he was still there after I left, he was very strong on doing this. Hmm. And uh, maybe if he'd stayed, he would have guided it through, but I don't know. It, we, we had a very difficult time with it. It's, for Amdahl, it was expensive. UTS paid for itself. Now, Amdahl <laughs> uh, decided to uh, expand UTS and see if it couldn't, you know, make a big operating system out of it, uh, expand it so it would be used by lots of other people. Uh, that ultimately turned out not to be successful. And uh, it was one of the reasons that uh, uh, I uh, was, uh, I disagreed with it, 
and uh, and so I ended up not running the project anymore. That program it was not, uh, and uh, and ultimately I left Amdahl a couple of years later. But so they wanted to make UTS more of a universal large system. Universal. Universe. Well, it was large system, all right. It just wasn't universal. It was a, it, and I, they were going to put a lot of facilities into it that MBS had, uh, and, and I'm not entirely clear. I, I, w I was on the peripheral of that, periphery of that, and not in the middle of it. So I can't be very specific, uh, okay. but I know they they had several hundred programmers working on enhancing UTS to oh. make it a more general operating system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, it really didn't work uh, because I think the market just wasn't there. I mean, you know, nobody wanted to, to spend a lot of money on a, uh, th unless you were hooked on Unix in the first place, which the phone company was. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I think it made sense in that case. But um, it didn't make sense to make it a general purpose operating system. And uh, So what, what were you doing at the time that that project, somebody else was I was working. I was working. I moved over to a staff position okay. under Bill O'Connell, who was an old-time IBMer, and worked on uh, a number of things. The most interesting one of which didn't see the light of day either. <laughs> it was a, a a programming system called Huron that uh, that was invented by a man uh, at Amdahl who. Uh, uh, it was a fourth generation kind of operating system, but I th always thought rather better than any of the fourth generation ones that I saw at the time uh, that m vastly simplified programming for database operations. Uh, had its own database, uh, had its own programming language, had a total of, as I recall, about 20 operation codes. <laughs> that simple. Can you do it that simply? In fact, I had exactly that reaction out of a senior vice president at Amdahl when I told him that. Wait a minute, let me get out my green card here. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but the operating system had about 20 operation codes, and mm. you could do it all. Bec and I know that because I did the programming myself to prove to myself. The ultimate test, I always thought, of a application programming system is can you write a bill of materials processor? You're familiar, presumably, with bill of materials processors, but they're completely, uh, they have to handle uh, uh, recursive operations, deeply recursive operations. Right, right. And if you can get through that <laughs> with a system like this, I think it will do just about anything. <laughs> and I did that. I wrote a bill of materials processor, that, uh, a demonstrator that I said satisfied me that, yep, you can do that with, with Huron. They never were able to sell it. I think they, Amdahl really had a difficult time promoting anything except its large mainframes. And I think that was part of the culture, part of the executive culture, and part of the sales culture was, boy, there's so much money to be made in these big boxes that it's not, it's, these other things are just sort of peripheral side issues, whereas to make something like a Huron Go, I think it needs a big push. IBM could have done it if they'd want to, I wanted to, but, uh, as far as I know, nothing ever came of Huron. Well, let's see. So, um, in 1989, was it, you said you left Amdahl? I left Amdahl in 89. And you were on the staff, you were a staff assignment at that time? I was, yes. Okay. I was. And you decided to retire? I decided to retire. I thought I was going to retire and write a book. Well, I wrote the book, and uh, it was a novel about an American pilot in the Battle of Britain. Ah. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I got very interested in writing and uh, did a lot of studying about writing and, and wrote the book. And uh, I also took time to uh, design an, the house that we live in now. Not, I mean, I had an architect as well, but I was very in, in the middle of the basic layout of things. Uh, and then I uh, also tried to start a consulting business. Uh, 
by that time, I had pretty well figured out that software process was a really important thing that needed to be understood by a lot of people. And, and I wasn't the only one that figured that out. There were a lot of others at the time, and, and most of them were, were okay. I thought some of the, some of the, a lot of the ideas, I don't know if you ever heard of clean room programming, but that was an IBM invention. A couple of guys at IBM that did a thing called clean room programming. And those ideas are very hard, are very, there's very strict disciplines involved in that. All of those disciplines are not practical in a normal software shop, but right. some of the ideas are very practical. But by that time, I had become convinced that specifications, uh, you know, good specifications, external and good internal specifications are absolutely worth everything because you can make mistakes there and fix them in nothing flat. Uh, you can show people what you're thinking about, and hopefully they can understand it. If you've written it clearly, it has to be written clearly or possibly demonstrated on a, you know, you may have to build a mock-up prototype, prototype sort of things. Yeah. But all that stuff really pays off because if you get that right, you can then go write the code and, and produce something that everybody knows what they're going to get. Yeah. You also have to think about, in doing this sort of thing, you've got to think about release two and three. <laughs> We learned that in OS, uh, but you can't do everything in release one. The most important thing to do in the first release of something is don't make it too complicated because it's going to take you a long time to get it to work. Yeah. And uh, you want to get out with something that's that's going to be useful and puts your allows you to do something and then follow it as soon as you can with stuff that enhances it and makes it better and makes people gives people confidence, your customers and your salespeople confidence that, that uh, this is going to go someplace. So it's, uh, but that process of, of specifications and how to write specs and all that stuff was very interesting to me, still is. Okay. So author and uh, home designer and consultant from <laughs> 89 to 95? 95, yeah. And then in 95 you uh, joined Tandem. I joined Tandem. I went over to Tandem I went over there one day, a tool. I had developed a tool for writing internal specifications, for writing pseudocode using Word so that you could do it on a Word system. You know, just sit down in front of Word, and huh. bring this up, and it was a Mac written all in macros for Word. Okay. And, and write pretty good pseudocode conveniently, you know, with all the indentations and all that stuff taken care of so that uh, kind of automatically. And uh, I took it over there to show it to him. And uh, I ended up signing on. <laughs> I ended up going to work for him and didn't do anything with that particular thing that, that didn't have anything to do with it. It just sort of got me in the door and they, in the end, we, uh, we, we made a deal. So I went to work for them as a program manager, uh, <coughs> worked on several different programs. The first one was a... Uh, uh, software by which they were uh, with an internal system for Tandem to run their business. And it was, uh, I guess it was included the software release. It was a software side of the business. Mm. And, uh, okay. A set of tools for that. And then uh, and all got taken over by, Amdahl, just before it got taken over by Compaq, uh, thought about getting itself into the uh, mini computer business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was over with that group for a while, nothing significant there. And then uh, that evaporated when Compaq took us over because they did all the mini computer <laughs> business. Okay, so just to go back a second, Tandem yep. was about a 20 year old company when you joined them and they had made all their money and still, I think, we're pretty successful in doing nonstop systems exactly. for the banking industry and probably yeah, some others. Yeah, it's banking and hospitals and uh, stock exchanges. It's any place where you, yeah, let me take a minute. That's good. I'm glad you stopped me on this. Anywhere where you really can't afford to go down uh, at all. Uh, tandem systems are expensive. Uh, they're not cheap. They're not a cheap way to do this. Uh, they're not some corner-cutting way to do it. They're expensive systems. Uh, they give you quicker uh, turnaround uh, rollover times than you can get 
out of a mainframe built to do similar things. Uh, those that, so the guys that buy them uh, will tell you, we buy Tandem because we like to go home on the weekends and get some sleep and rest and not <laughs> expect a call in the middle of the night. Well, between the Tandem hardware, which did that, and the software, because they write their own software, uh, and their database, which is an excellent database and built to be completely uh, um, as bulletproof as you can do it, uh, probably better than any other database system in the world, hmm. uh, and to provide automatic recovery for anything that, that, that goes wrong. Uh, it's such that, 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 and it is today the core of the HP nonstop, uh, nonstop. They call it the nonstop uh, division, I guess. Okay. It's, it's the it's it still is the HP nonstop division, and it's the same, sa it's the, the same stuff. Of course, it's all more modern and mm -hmm. updated and faster and bigger and all that. But I mean, literally, with a tandem system, uh, something goes wrong. Uh, the what happens? Is the, the system, there's a red light that goes on. Some you know in the in the unit that's wrong. The unit calls the central customer engineering place and says we've lost this unit, <laughs> and uh, you know come and fix it when you can. Well, a guy can can go out there and fix it right then and there, or if he wants, he can wait till the next day or. Uh, <laughs> Monday morning. <laughs> because the backup system or systems keeps going. Because the whole thing is so completely backed up. And it'll back, up, back itself up from, uh, you know, a failure in, in uh, uh, Cupertino or, or, or here can be picked up instantly on a machine in, in Chicago if they're set up for it. Huh. It's a straight boom. Uh, and they really had worked that out probably as well as anybody in the world. I mean, uh, for commercial systems. I'm sure the military stuff is more sophisticated, but it, uh, th this was their specialty. And they charge for it, and they are still, there's still lots of customers who won't do anything <laughs> else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was 95, but 97, Compaq acquires Tandem. That's right. Now, you're not deeply involved in Tandem software now. You're in their administrative systems. Well, I was in, uh, that's true. By that time, I was working on the mini computer side okay. of, of, of uh, Tandem, and we gave that up. Was that, oh, okay. And I took over a group that was involved in what they called solutions. It was ways of exploit, it was, it was things like uh, big data, uh, meta, uh, what do you call it? Uh, big data is what it's big called data. today. Yeah. yeah, the big data systems for uh, uh, searching large uh, file collections of files, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. banking systems, uh, finance systems. Uh, what else did we have? We had an automatic banking uh, system that uh, was based on a tandem thing, uh, ATM. Had an, an ATM, uh, special ATM, with a bunch of little things. That, and I stayed there for a while, uh, and then decided I wanted to not quite work so much, and that I would like to do some technical writing. So I got myself hired as a technical writer. By that time, I'd written that book, and I went over to the head of technical writing, and I said, look, I'd like to work for you, and I believe I could help you a lot. And uh, read this if you want to see whether I can write or not. So he did. <laughs> Hired me and okay. uh, put me to work on uh, uh, Tandem Compact. Uh, the, the, that unit, that nonstop unit, was just getting into dynamic link libraries. And uh, so I was given the assignment of writing uh, something about Tandem, th th and they wanted to get something written down about it. Uh, they didn't, weren't ready for manuals yet, but uh, I got into it and got in. There were two guys who were key to it. Uh, Daryl High is one of their chief architects, High, H-I-G-H, Daryl. And uh, he had written the specifications for it, and Daryl's a wonderful guy, and but a an elaborate writer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, uh, 
very carefully written, but all the details are right down to the, and uh, has to be very carefully read. So I used his specification in order to say, because nobody knew what a DLL was in tandem. No, nobody had any idea. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write a paper and say, what's a DLL? <laughs> and so I wrote it. And it was a big hit uh, because in, in about 15 pages, you could really understand what the heck was going on with DLLs. And so I then turned around and said, okay, I'm going to write, write, while they are still designing it, by the way, I'm going to write the manual, uh, which I think is probably a good idea anyway. Write the operating manual <laughs> while you're designing because you're going to find a lot of interesting things as you go through this, and we did. I turned up a number of problems in the, that, you know, inconsistencies yes. and things. Yes. And uh, I think I helped them. I know I learned a lot from the designers uh, and did write the manual. And the manual was the one that eventually, uh, eventually was published as part of the system uh, and wrote all the examples and uh, programming examples of things you could do and how to do it. And, and uh, uh, a lot of my friends have said, I've used your examples and proved it works just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's nice. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I did some technical writing. Okay, so that's, that's now still with uh, Tandem alone non, It's with the nonstop. Let's just say nonstop, yeah. Nonstop. Okay, nonstop. T nonstop has now become compact. Right. And uh, about the time nonstop became HP, yeah, about the time. I'm not just sure. There was 2002, was it? I've forgotten. Right. Well, in 1999, Carly Fiorina joined uh, AT&T, and in 2001, Compaq merged with HP. Yeah, oh, 2001. So 2001, okay. that's when that so merged. So 2001. So it's around 2001. Uh, the, uh, the guy who was running the DLL program, the program manager over all the software, uh, left. And uh, I got hired. I put up, went up for the job and said, OK, how about me? I know quite a bit about DLLs, and I'm ready to go back to work full time. <laughs> so I did. So I ran the DLL program for the next, which okay. was all the software to make the DLL systems work. Uh, this is what, like, how many people? Ballpark? Oh, ballpark. 40? Okay. 40, 50? Okay. Yeah, 40 or 50. Uh, and uh, we had a very successful DLL uh, design. Tandem by that time, H nonstop, let me say nonstop by that time, had really finally got its act together on process. They had learned that you cannot force schedules down engineers' throats. You have to uh, plan carefully. You have to follow a process of specifications and reviews uh, because it's those reviews and the modifications that come out of that that get you to the idea of writing error-free code, which is what ought to happen. You don't, testing is important, uh, it's vital, but uh, it's not the way to debug software. Software should be debugged by reviews and, and writing. Uh, the, and they had got that pretty well under control and, and, and I wasn't a part of that. I watched it happen. I thought I was sort of in admiration of the fact that, you know what, these guys actually figured this stuff out. Mm -hmm. uh, Good. Stuff that I'd been talking about for a long time. They really got it in the culture. And uh, so uh, we had a very successful uh, DLL program. It took a couple of years. Uh, I, I was program manager there, uh, introduced it. And it went out and did not have a lot of problems. It, it, it just went in very smoothly. Largely, partly because of the process I just described, but also largely because the initial specification that Daryl High had written was very clear about what it was we had to do. And he had thought it all the way through. And it just provided the integrity for the whole thing. So mm. I think that integrity the completeness of the specification and following the process made it just go really easy. It was not a hard job. <laughs> okay, well we've got um, <coughs> Tandem now being taken over by um, 
HP. Yes. It's still non or not it's nonstop. It's nonstop. It's still you a nonstop our division HP. of HP. Yes. And um, and you are leading a group of about uh, forty or fifty folks. Um, and what year are we in now? I'm. No, I've lost uh, my. This must be. 2001 is when Compaq merged with HP. Yeah, I'm thinking that uh, it must be about 2005, four or five. Well, that's just about the time that uh, Carly Fiorina was uh, ousted. Yeah, she was ousted while I was there. That have any effect on you? No, not that I know. I mean, I, it, it didn't affect us directly. Okay. Uh, she was trying to do a job that I think she was hired for, which was to make HP more market sensitive. Uh, there are a lot of HP people who didn't like her. Her style was not very, you know, compatible with what they did. They'd been used to an entirely different style. On the other hand, she definitely was trying to do something that we coming from the outside at least I did, thought HP needed. It they needed to be done. Needed to be done. Okay, it wasn't easy, uh, and maybe she wasn't even successful. Though the acquisition of Compaq, uh, an awful lot of the products in the subsequent years that went out, the small machine products, came out of Compaq. They didn't come out of HP. They mm -hmm. came out of Compaq. An awful lot of the money that HP made on small computers was Compaq yeah. or Urge. Yeah. So it's not clear a lot of people like to say it was a big mistake. Uh, it's not clear that it was a big mistake. I think she was not the right kind of a person to be in there for the long haul, and maybe they could have done a better job of picking somebody different. I don't know. They but you did work for Mark Hurd for a year or two. Mark Hurd, uh, and uh, they, he was there for a year or two. That's correct. And uh, he uh, was uh, he was a different kind of a guy. Uh, very oriented toward the, the, the business, and, and he had a good computer background. I mean, he came yes. from the National Cash yes. Register. And, and even a software background. I yeah, think. exactly. And he, though he got us into, uh, he got the nonstop division into uh, some stuff that I don't think they've yet recovered from, uh, which was trying to compete with Teradata. Uh, they tried to do some things that uh, Teradata had done with their huge file systems, and and uh, uh, and Teradata had been at this a long time, yes, and had, was quite successful in their own right. And it was a tough market to crack into. Uh, the uh, database boxes, database boxes, yeah. We, uh, as far as I was concerned, I <coughs> went on to run another program that had to do with how to put better communication processors on the, on the tandem systems. Oh, really? Yeah. We back uh, to the beginning. Huh? Back to the beginning. Very interesting because when I was asked to do this, somebody knew that I'd worked on the 7750 <laughs> and they said, you know what, we want to ask you to come <laughs> back and do this again. So I was program manager on the uh, communication processor and the idea was to have small computers uh, front-end computers that, that did the work of managing the communications and take that off of the main processor. Wintel type or were you going to make your own operating uh, system? We were doing our own. Now let me think whose processor they were using. I don't remember. I don't remember whose processor it was. Uh, Going blank on that, hmm. Uh, but it was a separate processor, mm -hmm. stored programmed, uh, was a very sophisticated, it was not a little machine at all. It was, uh, in terms of memory and that sort of thing, it was quite sophisticated and did an awful lot of the things that, uh, uh, managing the communications and managing the protocols and all of those things that, that communication systems have to do, uh, was done in a little box, on a box off the, off the mainframe. Uh, so that was the idea, and I think they've uh, eventually shipped it. I think they shipped it after I left. Uh, I retired in 2007, early in 2007. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, so <coughs> this time for real. <laughs> Made it stick this time. Made it stick. Good. Yeah. Well, and so now, obviously, 2007 till now, you are retired, I and um, I saw that you did a theater review. My wife did. Your wife did. Oh, it's my wife. No, no, and your wife's no name me. is Nomi. No You've me. been married for 33 years. 33 years. 30, 32. I, 33. 33. Mm -hmm. 33. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. And. I wanted to ask you about the book you wrote about your dad. Yeah. Well when did you do that? Uh, when? Well, so I, I started, this started about four years ago when I, uh, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> and, uh, but a friend finally uh, convinced me that if I didn't write this book, nobody was going to. And it is a pretty interesting untold story about in naval aviation. And so my daughter, my oldest daughter, uh, and I decided to do this together. So we've been working on it for about four years. Uh, my father was uh, uh, quite a well-known test pilot in the Navy. And that was his main test flying, flight test engineering. Uh, he retired as a vice admiral, and uh, the airfield at the Naval Air Station Patuxent River is named after him. Terrific. So. Uh, he was quite well known in the Navy, uh, not so well known outside the Navy. So we decided to write a book to explain his life, what it, what it was he did. And so he got into flight testing in the uh, 1930 time period, 1930, and was in flight test most of his Navy career when it wasn't, uh, well, even a good deal of wartime. He was uh, a test pilot from 30 to 32. Flew off the Macon, the Macon that operated mm -hmm. out of Sunnyvale. Mm -hmm. out of, uh, he was in the flight, he was in the, the heavier than air unit that flew on and off the Macon. Okay. <coughs> and the Akron, before her. Um, but was stationed here at, at uh, Sunnyvale when uh, Macon was here. Uh, he was, uh, Flew in a lot of scouting and patrolling, and and then at the right at the beginning, as World War II was about to break, was had broken in the, in Europe already. Uh, he went back to head as head of flight test, uh, senior flight test officer for the Navy, <coughs> and hmm. struggled for the next three years to bring the Corsair and the Hellcat in particular, and actually all of the airplanes that that the Navy used in World War II were were tested and redesigned some of them and changed and uh, by the flight test unit at, uh, that he commanded at Anacostia, Virginia, Anacostia, D.C. Uh, then he was in the South Pacific for the last two years of the war and then came back and was head of the flight test, the uh, Naval Air Test Center at Patuxent River, which uh, uh, Patuxent was set up as a test center in, during the war. Mm -hmm. He went back as head of the test center and was there for four years, and his major contribution there was in getting the Navy into jets, because uh, nobody knew what a Navy carrier-based jet exactly had to do. It was a whole new game with jet yeah. propulsion, a whole bunch of compromises in airplane design and, and uh, ship design and so on that he was really in the middle of. So, uh, wow. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, left there in 1950 and uh, was skipper of a big aircraft carrier and then made admiral and and uh, retired early. He had a heart, heart condition that ah. uh, retired him at age 50, <laughs> which is a bit young. But he lived quite a bit longer. He lived until 19... I thought he was 73 and uh, was a But you, s did he leave materials for you that you used in your book? He left nothing. Well, almost nothing. I've got his log books. He didn't write, he was not a writer. Okay. Uh, uh, he, I have one document, that, uh, 160 page document he wrote on how to, how to manage a patrol, pl patrol plane, uh, a, a seaplane. Managing seaplanes uh, on the water, uh, docking 
mooring, uh, dealing with crosswinds, all this stuff. <laughs> he oh. was an avid sailor, so yeah. he, he, this stuff was all second nature to him. And, and uh, he wrote this thing that I, I guess was, might have been why they used. <laughs> but he wrote that, and, and uh, that's one of the things I have. But he didn't write much else. It's very, there's a very few things. We had to do a lot of digging. I, I would think that would be a pretty difficult book to write then. Well, I, I don't know how to compare it to other books. I know I spent a lot of time in the, in the uh, National Archives uh, digging through uh, stuff, reports, old reports, flight test reports, uh, a lot of time at the Naval Air Test Center, at the test pilot school at the Naval Air Test Center. He was instrumental in getting the test pilots, Naval Test Pilot School started, which is uh, a wonderful school. They graduated over 4,000 people, all the Navy and Marine astronauts are test pilot school graduates, and, uh, and it has helped to populate the Navy with people who are really, really knowledgeable about airplanes and how they work and how they fly and why. <laughs> well, and uh, I take it, that I infer that, that your granddaughter's the one who sort of prompted you to do this. No, and you wasn't. did it with her? No. No, no. She just decided to sign on with me. Uh, yeah, she's, she's, of course, long okay. since grown and, and kids of her own that are practically grown up so uh, but she knew him and she decided she wanted to be part of writing this so she's okay. she and I cooperated on the writing so it's, it's uh, and that book is out now and available right the book is not out and available uh, I wish I could say it were it is in the hands of the US Naval Institute press as we speak and uh, we are in discussion with them about what they're going to do about it. They say they'd like to publish it, uh, and they don't think they can make money at it, however, and that's a consideration. So uh, they were, are looking right at this as we speak for a subvention, a donation, uh, which we as authors can't give uh, to support the publication of this book. And hopefully, uh, we are working to try to raise some money. <laughs> so. Uh, Yes, that's what, okay. we're, what I'm involved in right now. <laughs> yeah. So well, I haven't, it's interesting because a lot of what you've asked me about and a lot of things I haven't really thought about for so long. <laughs> I've been much more involved in aviation and, uh, uh, well, a lot in software stuff, some of the software process things, but, but going back in history to the IBM time has been Quite an interesting adventure. Well, as we uh, wind down now, is there anything that I've sort of that, that that you would like to that I that we didn't get into that you'd like to get into? I don't think of it right now. I think uh, we've pretty well. Hit all well, the you know, when I I give tours here, and when I give a tour, I say, "Hey, that 360 code that's still running today." <laughs> So I'll bet there's a lot of your code that, you know, that OS 360 uh, there probably code is. is still running there today. probably is. <laughs> and that's, uh, code that's got to be a heck of an achievement. A long time. Yeah, is when we built it, it was, I remember the first release of PCP was 40, 440,000 bytes. And we th that was the biggest piece of commercial code that it, we think that had ever been written. Uh -huh. 440,000 bytes. Yeah. I mean, today, <laughs> it's not even, it's yeah. nothing. <laughs> it's just amazing how things have changed. And yet, it, we had so much trouble with uh, trying to fit it, that, and as we've talked about. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge piece of code. Well, what, uh, just a couple of kind of, Summary questions. What yeah. do you th what do you think is your the biggest contribution you've made? Was it question mark? Uh, I never thought of myself as making contributions. Isn't that an interesting question? Uh, I guess the things that I thought were the most innovative were the seventy seven fifty. Some of the communication patents, I got an IBM patent award, which uh, uh, I've forgotten there are four or five patents that, that I was on, uh, that had to do mostly with communications and, and how to do that. Uh, those are important contributions. I think uh, getting the Hursley Lab on the map, on the worldwide map, was probably an important 
contribution because uh, it was doing that. We had to get it into where it was inseparable from what IBM was trying to do worldwide, and that was that I think was a contribution. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, OS, yeah, I think it, it's trying to get that out the door was uh, uh, a, a, a very difficult, and, and we did it. You know, we actually got the darn thing delivered. <laughs> Some of the uh, building that little operating system for WaveTech was pretty challenging and interesting, and quite a different kind of operating system. It was not like nothing I had seen before. It used some techniques that I knew about, but I'd never seen them implemented. And we implemented, it and it came out very nicely. Uh, uh, the uh, it was not a straightforward operating system. It it, it handled. Uh, I can't think of the name of it, so I'm not going to struggle with it too long. But it was a different sort of architecture for the software. Uh, I think getting that DLL program out that I talked about with Tandem was, uh, as I say, there was so incredibly assisted by having the right design and the processes there. But it went quite smoothly and and. A lot of people thought that was a good thing. Uh, if I can get this book published, <laughs> I think that'll be a <laughs> contribution. <laughs> so maybe uh, I'm okay, any I actually designing our house was an interesting thing too. That, uh, we a place we love, location <laughs> we like. <laughs> and any. Uh, Comments about some of the people you worked for, like who's the who you think are some of the really good executives that you worked for and respected well, most. Well, that's interesting. The, the most the ones that left the biggest impression were people like John Hanstra, uh, Bob Evans. Of course, leaves an impression, left an impression everywhere he went. Uh, he. Uh, uh, was very, very forceful guy, well known. He's forceful. Uh, he's. Uh, I had a lot of arguments with Bob. Uh, I have to say he let me win, at least the important ones. <laughs> we, he, uh, in the course of developing the 360, developing the 360, we had to have. There was certain equipment we had to have in order to build the cards, the SLT cards. And we had to build some of them on our own. We were doing memories, read-only memories, uh, and we had to build the cards for those. Uh, and uh, the machine that did that, they only built 11 of them, I think. And uh, I got my mine allocated pretty early by making sure that I got on the list. And he tried to eliminate it at one point, <laughs> and I said, "Look, you guys, you cannot take this thing away. We are three thousand miles from you, and we can't do this unless you let us have this." And we argued a little bit. He eventually gave me that. Uh, he wanted to do some things with OS that I was pretty obstinate about not allowing, because we were so overwhelmed. I just refused to take on anything extra, and uh, I'm. It's one of those things where you're under enough stress that looking back on it, you wonder whether you made the right decision. But I think it was the right decision. I just refused to pay any attention to it. And uh, it was some stuff that they were doing in federal systems when he was running that. And they really wanted to get that incorporated into OS. And I just said, no, we're not going to do that. Anyway, we had those kind of arguments. Uh, who else? Uh, Chuck Branscombe, who I liked a lot, thought he was a really good guy. Watts Humphrey, I worked for. His, he was always very uh, nice, uh, very polite guy, very structured, a um, bit more structured than I'm. Uh, I used to deal with, and I'm pretty structured too. So <laughs> uh, I don't think we ever crossed swords. Not. Not in the way I did with Evans. Uh, John Faircloth worked for me, 
but he was a really good guy. He and I got along very well. I got along very well with all those guys in England. They were a really good, good group, good group, very good group. And they stayed right in the middle of everything from then on. As far as I know, they're still in there. Uh, the uh, I knew Tom Watson from a distance, uh, but enough to talk, chat with him easily. Uh, he. I knew Dick Watson very well, uh, his brother, who uh, I think was not anywhere nearly as effective as Tom in uh, the leadership he provided, uh, not as strong a personality, but a nice man. Uh, and he was running World Trade when you were He was running there. World Trade, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was running World Trade. Uh, and he liked, he liked to talk to engineers, and he, he, it, it, it suited him to to get down and find out what's going on, you know, with engineers, and so, and and I was one he knew, and I could speak English, and oh. <laughs> so he uh, he sat definitely was a, uh, a a mentor, in a way. I mean, mm -hmm. I could go to him. I actually never had to. I indirectly I did. This is an interesting thing. Uh, when I was trying to get the Model Forty set in England, one of the things we had to do was get the budget for it. Now, World Trade didn't have the budget for it. Uh, in fact, all the budget for this developing this product line was over in Data Systems Division. And uh, so uh, we weren't going to get the budget. We had, theoretically, we had the, the job, but no budget. So I went to my boss, who at the time was Byron Havens. He succeeded, yeah, Byron Havens succeeded uh, Gardner Tucker. And he was in White Plains. I went to him and said, look, I, we, we got to get the budget settled. And he said, we haven't got the money. And I said, OK. And what do you think we ought to do? He said, well, I think you ought to go to Poughkeepsie and ask them if they've got the money. <laughs> so so I, uh, uh, I, I went to see Max Paley. Who, Max Paley? Oh, yeah. 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 Max, worked yeah. For, Max worked for Bob right. in Poughkeepsie. And Max had the. DSD product stuff. So I, I, I had just come across the Atlantic. I was, I was pretty tired. And I remember that, and I called up Max one in the afternoon after he told me I had to go to Poughkeepsie, and I said, Max, I got to talk to you in the morning. Uh, and uh, he said, Okay. Uh, he said, Come up, uh, come up early. You know, come, come and see me at eight o'clock, and and uh, I'll leave room for you then. So I did. I got to Poughkeepsie the next morning at 8 o'clock, and I go into Max's office. I said, Max, I need a million bucks. And uh, that started the conversation. And <laughs> he ended up by saying, I haven't got a million bucks. <laughs> I said, OK. Uh, and uh, so I went back down to see my boss, uh, see Byron that afternoon. And I said, Max doesn't have the money. And Byron says, well, I guess that's it. And I said, look. Everybody has agreed that the Hersley Lab should do this, that it's capable of doing it, and there's money to build this machine. We all agree that that's there, but I can't get it. And I guess I don't accept this, and I want to take the open door to Dick Watson and explain the situation to him. Mm -hmm. Well, that electrified everybody. You remember about the open door? Oh, oh yes. Yeah, <laughs> the open door allowed you to go. So I, I invoked the open door, <laughs> and pretty soon things started to happen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, we got the money. Well, we got terrific. The, we got the money within a matter of a few days. And uh, so that was, yeah. yeah. So Dick Watson helped me indirectly there. Because well, <laughs> I knew he would accept me. I knew he would be happy to, to, to see me. <laughs> and he probably would have solved the problem if. Well, that and, and he helped you solve the problem with something that you feel was one of your most important contributions. Yep, I that's think right. That's terrific. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, uh, Chris, it's just been a great pleasure for me. It really cool. has. And, uh, Good, I've enjoyed it. I hope that sometime I get to show you around the museum and okay. kind of point to some of the All things right. you were talking about. Okay. Because it's... Uh, well, I'd, uh, are you here many days or...? Well, I, we'll, we'll figure it out sometime. I come in every Thursday, as a matter of fact. Thursday. But but other days as well, so okay. anyway. Good, good. Well, I guess. 
So, Eric, I, as far as I'm concerned, we're finished, and uh, appreciate your help. Thank you, yeah. And uh, Fritz, I certainly enjoyed our conversation. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I enjoyed it, too. And, uh, thought you were very good. When the <laughs> historians read this 30 years from now, they'll, <laughs> they'll learn a lot about, about running a big programming project, or a small one for that matter. Yeah. Well, good.